Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to another installment of the Warwick F1 show. It has been a few days since we saw the prestigious 2024 Monaco Grand Prix, which saw Leclerc finally take his maiden Grand Prix win uh, at, uh, yeah, like I said, his home Grand Prix after reliability issues, team and driver issues alike. He's finally reached the top step of the podium, beating the Australian of uh, Oscar Piastri uh, by nearly 10 seconds uh, by the end and leading every lap of the Grand Prix. Uh, and rather strangely, it also saw uh, Red Bull with a very tough day at the office, Verstappen being bogged down in P6 uh, for pretty much the whole race and also Perez after qualifying P18 going out in Q1, being caught up in a first lap incident with the two Haas drivers, which saw all three of them DNFing. So we'll be talking about all of that and, and more on today's episode. Um, I'm your host, Callum. I'll be joined by Chimme and Will Biddles. Thank you very much for joining me today, guys. Uh, and we'll first off get our rating out of the way because I don't think it's going to be very high, is it? Um, I mean, obviously, it's Monaco, so we, we come to expect that there's not going to be the most overtaking as possible. But despite that, did it still have more to give for, for its, even its own standards, would you say, compared to previous years? It's one of those ones that if we hadn't had a red flag, it could have been an amazing race between the top forward strategy and everything because they're all so close throughout the whole race. Like, although I guess we'll never know what the true pace of those cars were because no one really pushed. Like You could see the fact that George Russell was catching them at the end on 76 lap old medium tyres, so just how hard they were pushing. Um, in terms of a rating, I'm probably biased because obviously as a Ferrari fan, seeing Charles win at home, I want to say 10, but as an actual race, it was like a one. Like it was just, they had like some suspense, but like Russell. Can we, really think, can we take an one. average of that perhaps? Can we do an average of that perhaps? We'll do like a four. Though, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a mid, very mid race. Yeah, no, yeah. indeed. Jimmy, what did you think? Things, I'll give a five for two reasons. A, first lap chaos. And B, Charles Clear winning. Finally, the curse. Uh, has uplifted itself <laughs> for once. So, you know, in that case, but then as a race, it was a minus 15 out of 10. So it would be, um, I, would, I would still give it a five only because uh, uh, we got a very likable podium. Piastri and his uh, adopted brother, Piastri Leclerc. <laughs> and then, so, um, yeah, I mean, of course, I think if it wasn't for the first lap chaos, I think we'd have definitely had a really good strategy race to see, you know, how because uh, obviously everyone have to do a pit stop at that point. But because of the red flag, I blame Magnussen and Perez, um, blame them for not having that strategy race and everyone pitting on the first lap itself. But yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously there's there are a few talking points, but again, just Monaco being Monaco at the end of the day. No, I have to agree with you on, on the ratings. And and even though, yes, I probably would say that it's better or I'd give it a higher rating than what I did for, for last weekend, um, just because of maybe that first lap chaos. In a way, it, it did kind of kill it off a bit because, as we said, the, the, the every team knew that, you, you know, you can't overtake here. So it was a very viable strategy, probably the best strategy to try and nurture those ties to the end. We've seen multiple examples of how over the years a car that, isn't as good on pace, maybe through tire wear or issues. Obviously, we've seen Daniel Ricciardo win in 2018 when he was down on uh, on power um, significantly, and Lewis Hamilton win with having something like 100% tire wear. So they know that it's possible to get those tires to the end, and that's probably why um, everyone was just kind of involved in not really a strategy game, but just kind of nurturing those tires. And um, that's probably, as we said, why it's. Uh, quite unfortunate that we didn't get the, the, the strategy battle that we were hoping for. Uh, but we'll jump right into winners and spinners, as we usually do. And uh, we're at, we are going to have to first talk about uh, the two Ferraris. Um, obviously, it was um, it, it did seem like probably quite a, uh, not too much of a boring race from Charles Leclerc, but I think there's certainly more to be appreciated from how much he he like just completely dominated the race and... Um, and was just able to control the race from the very beginning. And 
and really lead every lap of the Grand Prix, as, as we say. But then also Carlos Sainz as well, doing a very good job being there for Ferrari as, I guess, the kind of second driver in this race and, and getting another place on the podium. And now Ferrari has seemed to close up to Red Bull in the, in the Constructors' Championship. They're now only 24 points away. Um, did you, do you guys think that this is a cause for concern for Red Bull over the past couple of races? Yeah, I think it definitely is. I think the trend we're seeing is that you might see Max Verstappen might win the Drivers' Championship, but they might finish third in the Constructors with the rate Ferrari and McLaren are going at. I think what, for me, was most impressive about Ferrari this weekend was that whenever they, for both drivers, not just Charles, was whenever they wanted to, they could just drop the car behind them. So we saw at the end when Charles knew that he could, he just pulled away from Piastri and Science would just periodically drop back and catch back up to Piastri and Norris never really had any sort of a sniff. It was just quite impressive between both of them just to see that A, they could actually manage tyres for the first time ever as a Ferrari team this season, which is really nice to see. And also that they have that kind of confidence in the new upgrades, especially Leclerc, just to be able to put his foot down, feel the cars can do exactly what he wants, even when the tyres are so old. We might actually be seeing the effects of the uh, aero regulation, like the aero restrictions coming into play now, finally. Uh, for Red Bull, um, but then also, I'm not sure. We'll have to see in Canada, to be brutally honest, for a verdict to be made because both Imola and Monaco are slow corner circuits, um, re- relatively. So again, it's going to be a bit interesting to see how um, you know they're doing races at Canada, and we have a few trucks with more higher speed corners, which generally the Red Bull has always been the best car out so yeah but then again well then also you also got the Paris effect (laughs) yeah it's it's a funny one though because I think the thing that they struggled with most wasn't necessarily the low speed it was the curb riding which again is a massive thing in Canada so they might struggle there and like there is a lot of high speed corners in Canada but the one that you get all the traction out that gives you the overtaking opportunity is the really low speed hairpin so yeah if they're struggling with that and curb riding, they're going to be real sitting ducks at the either the end of the long straight or at the start of the lap. So it'll be really interesting yeah. to see, especially Ferrari, if they can get that kind of high-speed corner set up down, they'll be really up there with that Red Bull. Yeah. Do you guys think that, that obviously, as, as we mentioned, that maybe the, the, the reason that Ferrari was so dominant in Monaco was more because the car suited that... Or the, the circuit suited their car. Do we think that there's enough races like that in for the rest of the season where they could actually make a serious challenge for the constructors' championship over Red Bull, or um, or or do they actually need to start if they want to be doing that, make more upgrades to their car and make sure that they tune that setup as Will mentioned to to work on a wider variety of tracks? I say at this rate they can. Because especially um, Paris is dropping off again, like we saw it last year. Like strong start, and now he then he just dropped off a cliff. I mean the P. I mean to be fair, he's not had the best qualifying record in Monaco, but P eighteen in the Red Bull, while Max was sixth, is a bit concerning. Um, yeah, and that took off for eight, and obviously it was a. Re- I think obviously the crash was more unfortunate. I wouldn't blame him too much on that part. Um, but yeah, at this rate. Yes, Perez may have had a solid few performances, but it's been no one near the standard that it needs to be for Red for Red Bull. And, you know, they have to scrap every point they can because not just from McLaren, Ferrari, they've got McLaren coming up on the rise as well. Obviously, McLaren have bought upgrades, uh, which also helps. And maybe they've still got the straight line speed issue, um, which will harm them in circuits like Canada. Um, but then... But then again, you also got Land- the likes of Lando Norris is on an unbelievable form right now. Oscar Piastri, um, if he can somehow find more home routes in Canada, then he will be absolutely unbelievable as well. Um, but yeah, I-, I guess it's more to do with who can out develop each other and who can really just get the setup right on the each weekend. And it's got to be it's going to be a battle like this for the whole rest of the season, I believe. Yeah, it's going to be about understanding your upgrade packages. I think that's what McLaren kind of showed in Imola. Like, person, I know I missed out the couple episodes when we were talking about these, but for me, 
Ferrari were stronger than McLaren in Miami, even though Norris won that race. I think had there not been the safety car issue and the safety car picking up Max, I think Lando might not end up even on the podium. Like, yes, that car was quick, but it it wasn't quite the same level as it was. And then in Imola, they were much stronger because they'd had that race to understand the upgrades and develop them. Whereas Ferrari have had that for Imola where they turned up, they didn't really understand. They had an idea of how it would work, but didn't have live data. So now they're actually going to another track, having understood that data a little bit more, it's how well can these teams understand and optimise these setups, like you said, Shinmei, to make sure that they're performing best at all the tracks, not just specific ones. Yes, certainly, uh, absolutely. It's, it's looking like it's shaping up to be a very interesting battle compared to... to to obviously what we had last season or rather lack of what we had last season um and it's it's i think definitely nice to see that that mclaren and ferrari have actually rose to the challenge of of having to upgrade their cars um at least from like as, as we said a development point of view um we'll touch on on maybe the perils of red bull in just a little bit but i i think it's also worth mentioning uh or it's it's yeah def definitely important to mention the mclarens because they also had a really good performance obviously the focus uh, was was on Leclerc winning his home race, and rightly so. But they had a very strong performance. Piastri putting in um, just a solid weekend all round, a brilliant weekend all round. Um, probably one of his best of the season. And then and then Norris uh, P4 as well. Do we think that that's kind of the most that they could manage for 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 this weekend? Or I mean, Piastri didn't look ever like he was going to challenge Leclerc as such for the win. I'd say I think we'd be we'd be quite surprised if it was if it was anyone but Leclerc, or maybe I guess if we said if it could be anyone else, it would be his teammate Carlos Sainz. And yeah, do we do we think that that's kind of all that they had in them for this weekend? I think it's probably more than what they had in them. I think realistically, coming in, you would have said, <clears throat> especially after free practice, Leclerc looked so far clear. You like okay, realistically, Sainz will be second and then third and fourth is what they're hopeful. So to get that second ahead of Sainz, especially in qualifying, was a massive effort from Piastri to be even like basically on pole. So it's, I think it would have been above what they would have hoped um, or what they would have expected, probably what they would have hoped for, best case scenario. Yes, certainly. No, that's um, that's that's a very good point. It's uh, perhaps some 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 good ground for them to work off, and a, and a couple of very good results that have gone their way in the past couple of races um, for uh, for them, and something to build on as we as we go into some of the the summer races. Um, but we'll park those teams there for now, uh, and we'll go on to some of our spinners. Obviously, the main one being uh, which we talked about quite a bit more was uh, was Red Bull, especially Perez. Um, obviously, Verstappen was looking not very good um, throughout the weekend, not not really strong. Obviously, it was very difficult for him to be able to overtake uh, around Monaco. And so he was kind of just bogged down in P6. Is that, do you think that's more to do with how they set up the car as such? Because it seems very odd, at least to me, with this with the form that he's shown over the past two years, that that a P6 for him would be purely down to... to to his performance um and especially given that what we saw with perez um with with how like how much he was he was bogged down as well it's maybe unsurprising to see that from verstappen and an indication that it's it's in the car so is is that what we thought and why verstappen was down in p6 yeah i think it was more to do with lack of lack, lack of overtaking opportunities in monaco uh, uh and as well as well. obviously yeah the performances play a big part because obviously he wasn't able to get the car in the front row in qualifying which in monaco especially is probably got the most important qualifying session of the entire year um but then again because obviously the state of the monaco circuit and then obviously the first lap incident kind of hindered verstappen as well because obviously he had to go into the medium tires um stuck behind russell and obviously the mercedes was actually relatively strong at some point at points during the weekend as well, because obviously there's no straight lines, especially with no with straight line speed not being an issue at all, and um, kind of playing to the small amount of strength that that car has. Um, so obviously P5 was um, P5 was probably the best Russell could do anyway. 
Um, and obviously, yeah, he hid just back the whole. It's basically the whole story. Of Monaco is like you can't just, you can't over, you can't really overtake. I think there's only one overtake like that's not a pit stop that happened the entire race. Which if or I don't know because yeah, I switched I switched off off a of lap forty. I can't there lie. There were quite a few on like Sergeant Joe and Bottas going back and forth at the end. All right, fair enough. Um, but yeah, no, I, I would. I, with Red Bull, it's just again with Verstappen, it's just really is it going to continue like this? But somehow they always bounce back. This is Red Bull. <laughs> I think it's just an inherent issue with the car. I think they complained all weekend about just not being able to like ride the curbs and to get the setup quite right to get the traction out the corners. I think when you look at how close that field was, I think other than Leclerc and Piastri, I think they're all within like two tenths of each other or something silly like that. So like. Not being able to ride those curves is going to be a massive difference, and they were they were he was up there until sector three every time, and then obviously clipping the wall to start Q, uh, for his final run. I think he probably would have ended up maybe third or fourth, and then it's hard to know what anyone's race pace was. But I think, I think he would have been good. I think they would have been. I think no matter where he qualified, that's where he was going to finish at the end of the day. It was it was one of those that uh, even Verstappen on new tyres couldn't overtake Russell. So I think that says all we kind of need to know about about the race. But it, I think it was more of a, not a setup issue, just a car's inherent problem. Yeah, certainly in qualifying, as uh, as we'll just mention, the, the gap between the top six drivers was actually three tenths, under three tenths. So ridiculously close in qualifying. Uh, gap to Sergio Perez from first was almost two seconds, so not a very strong weekend from him, as we, uh, <laughs> as, we as we, uh, as we've already said. And um, it's, yeah, it's 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 quite embarrassing from him, I think, and, and and not very impressive from him at this point. And again, like we mentioned, one of the most important uh, qualifying sessions of of the weekend, um, and he, he doesn't rise to the occasion at a track where really he's 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 shown to be strong at before he's obviously got a win um before in in that red bull seat and i mean i, I don't know I, i'm fed up of talking about sergio perez on this podcast we keep going back and forth between oh he's well at least i do about he's going he he deserves that 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 red bull seat and then and then he does something like this and we question whether he's uh whether he's whether he's good for that um so would you start looking for options after the the dreadful weekend that he's had? I mean, obviously he he was he made a crash in in the race, which is why he wasn't able to get any points. But then, you know, the, the reason that he was down there and, and was involved in an incident like that is because he qualified P eighteen. And you look at someone like Sonoda, for example. Sonoda's been having some brilliant races recently. He finished P eight in Monaco. And do you start looking at options for Sergio Perez going into the summer break? Would you even keep him on to the end of the season, given that we know how close Ferrari and McLaren are in the Constructors' Championship? I think it's one of those funny ones, because I think Yuki was is probably now the front runner to go in based on the season he's having. But I think he's shown that he needs to be comfortable in the car. He's not the sort of person you want to throw in in the middle of the season. So I think they keep Perez for the end of the season regardless. And then at the end of the year, they say, okay, this is the change we're making. And whether that's Sonoda or maybe even Sainz, we don't know. But I can't see them throwing anyone in unless it's Danny Rick, which I think would just be a massive mistake. So it's it's a tricky one. I think it's hard to judge in this weekend because even like Verstappen struggling and getting sick, which... Yeah, he probably would have done better had he not clipped the wall. It's still hard to know how much he's getting out of that car. So I think, yeah, Perez probably had a bad... I think he said he got impeded a little bit as well, which probably explains... Like, I think he thought he had the pace to be in, in at least halfway up key three. So it's it's a tricky one. I think wait until Max has another strong weekend and then judge him against that. But I think Monaco is a bit of a tricky one. Like If you have like one small error, then that's your weekend basically gone. And we've, we've certainly seen examples as well of, of when drivers have been rushed into that second seat at Red Bull that that it doesn't go well for them. We've had Gasly, we've had Albon, we've we've had we've had many examples, and and Red Bull are not uh, a very patient team. Chimay, do you do you see him there 
at, at the end of the season, Perez? At this point, I'll still say yes. They're not Chuck Perez at mid-season, unless the next few races uh, for the rest of the European season are, are genuinely awful. I don't see him being sacked until, or at least being reviewed until the end of the season. I think at this rate, I don't see Perez's contract being renewed. But, um, and obviously, they'll try and pave the way for the likes of Yuki Tsunoda or for some random odd reason, Danny Ricardo. Um, I, I still wouldn't. I still want to factor him out only because of the fact that he has the past experience of any Red Bull. As much as at the moment in his current form, he does not deserve to be in that seat. Um, but then, yeah, I suppose there is no, and especially obviously that like Will said with the risk of like, chucking a driver in mid-season, having to get used to the car. Who knows? That is a massive risk factor because obviously you don't know who's how good that you're going to be. Whereas at least with Paris, you have him as a known entity, and at least you got Paris. So at least Paris being that known entity, you have something to work with rather than working with something completely unknown. So in that case, I'd rather say, yeah, I don't think so. Paris would it would be possible for Paris to get the side mid season. Um, the only real driver who's at real risk right now is Danny Ricardo, but with Liam Lawson literally waiting like a vulture pick up the pieces but yeah let's see yeah i think uh, i think if well given given christian horner's current position at red bull i think if he did hire daniel ricardo into that second seat he might get sacked so i would advise him if, christian horner if you're listening to this podcast then uh don't get daniel rick into the second red bull seat uh uh if you want to keep your job but uh we'll move on from red bull uh so mercedes uh, having quite a solid weekend, uh, fifth and seventh, uh, as as Chima mentioned, not a, uh, a lot of straight line speed needed for Monaco, which may be why they they were very good. As I mentioned, Sonoda P8, Albon with a very respectable P9, giving out, uh, Williams their first points of the season. Um, I would just like to touch as well, though, upon uh, both Haas drivers. Uh, very odd weekend from Haas, and probably one to forget. Um, uh, I think it was a communication issue between their factory and their team or something like that uh, in, in qualifying meant that they were disqualified um, for breaching section 4.3.10A something or whatever. Or whatever. Um, and then getting involved in that first lap incident in the race with Sergio Perez. Um, and, for, and first off, I think Magnussen, was he at fault for that incident with Perez? I'd argue he was. I think he wasn't significant alongside. It's it's kind of the same argument as, as before, as, as, as what do you count as significantly, significantly alongside, I suppose. Um, but yeah, did we, do we think Magnussen needs to be penalised for that in the next race? Or should he have been rather? Because they didn't come to the conclusion that he, he should have. I don't think he should have. I'm of the controversial opinion that Perez is more at fault. Because as he comes out of turn one, he literally sweeps across the track. He like he just cuts across the track for no reason. Like he's up, he's up against the wall. Like it's turn one in Monaco. More than likely, if you've gone that way, someone will be coming up the inside of you, not coming up the outside of you when there's a wall next to you on the left. And yet he sweeps across and then leaves more room on the left hand side. Than he does on the right hand side. Is so that like, because he was yeah, expecting I mean, Nico Hulkenberg though? But Hulkenberg was behind Magnussen. This right, okay, get, correct. Like, so I think it's probably a racing incident more than anything, but I'd put more blame on Perez for just the way he drove, just like he's driving as if it's like quality or like halfway through the race when there's not going to be wheel to wheel racing and you can take that straight line up the hill. But we've seen in Monaco year after year, even in like the support races before that you can't just go straight up the hill you have to leave room the whole way you kind of have to just pick your line and go up it and just take whether it's the best line it's the worst on whatever you kind of have to stick to that or you're going to have these big accidents so to come out of turn one sweep across the track and then almost try and straight line it up the hill is just silly like you've just got to pick one side and leave room for it not keep changing your mind which way you want to go I mean, I mean, personally, yeah, I see where was coming from there because Perez does actually move on the right hand side, and I remember looking at the replay that Perez actually does look on the uh, 
look in the mirrors uh, to Magnussen literally like this microsecond before the collision happens. Um, but then again, I will, probably will give a 50-50 split because yes, Perez is cut inside a little bit, but then at the end of the day, I know it's also the first corner of the first lap, but Perez A is also on the racing line. B, he's really far ahead. If, literally, just his back was almost uh, pretty much ahead of Magnussen's front wheels. So Magnussen, Magnussen is still quite considerably behind. And it's really difficult to judge in the F1 cars, really, to see who's actually going to be behind you at points. I mean, obviously, they've got the bigger door mirrors this year, but um, uh, still, it's really, really hard to judge with mirrors in those cars. And not just that, Perez is actually also following the car in front. So he is kind of still following that racing line. He still has that right away. So, but then again, also, Magnussen, he's going to die. He's going to go in the inside. He's going to look at every, even the most minute of gaps. So I don't, at the end of the day, he's a racer. Um, so again, so I think it's just unfortunate. Yeah, certainly. It's, um, I think maybe the, the stewards did come to the right conclusion with, with the racing. And at the end of the day, we, we have to remember that we're judging decisions that are being made in a, like, my, it's a microsecond split decision uh, in the driver's minds in the in a first turn uh, of the Monaco Grand Prix. And uh, at the end of the day, I, can, I guess you could say both kind of, or all drivers, well, sorry, you know, both, I guess Hulkenberg should have been uh, shouldn't have been out, but both drivers did go out of the race, which uh, is obviously both disappointing for them. So I guess you could say that's kind of the, the, the punishment that they, they granted. Um, but it's also a very odd weekend for Haas, uh, from, from a Haas team that has seems to be going in the right direction from the points that they've scored uh, this season. We know that in the Constructors' Championship that they are that they are seventh, which is a very, very respectable compared to how bad they've been in previous years. And they seem to be on the way up, but then... Uh, it looks to be quite a quite a I don't want to say rookie error, but but it's like it's not very it's not something you see very often. Um, but um, but yeah, it, it was very odd to see that disqualification from Haas. And d do you know anything more about that the, the, than I do, Chim, mate? About the the exact details behind the what exactly happened with that with that qualifying incident? I think it was just a DRS infringement. It like it just it was like it's similar yes, to how like it, yeah. Lewis Hamilton's rear wing in Brazil twenty twenty one, where it was like point zero zero like really small. But I think this infringement was slightly bigger than that. So I think that's what it was. I'm not too. F I didn't really bother looking too much into it, to be brutally honest. Um, but yeah. Yeah, certainly, certainly a very costly uh, mistake for them, judging that um, they did well. They had decent qualifying. Hulkenberg was was uh, in P twelve in the Magson and P. Uh, oh, hang on, this is yeah, P twelve in the Magson P fifteen, I believe. Um, before before the the, the infringements were, were made, um, or, or something like that. It certainly wasn't at the back of the grid, um, but. Yeah, so definitely a weekend from them that they'll they'll want to forget. And finally, will I just want to touch upon Alpine? Almost a kind of a bittersweet weekend for them. Uh, Gasly scoring their second point of the season, which means that they are now level with Williams in the constructors on two points. Uh, obviously, Salva being uh, on nil. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, is we can't we shouldn't laugh we shouldn't laugh but yes yeah, it's quite funny um but yeah but then at the same time Ocon obviously um or Ocon and Gazi coming together in a first lap incident in the turn just before you get to the tunnel uh Ocon hangs on around the inside and he actually ends up um basically being flung up uh, and damaging his floor which meant that he had to retire early on in the race and it was very interesting. Uh, Bruno uh, Bruno Fami did not hold back in his uh, in his post race comments at the end, did he, Jimmy? It was it was uh... no. He, I'm literally reading. Really, he literally is like Esteban's attack was completely out of line, and there will be consequences. So he is being extremely blunt and brutal about this. I don't know what to think. Honestly, I don't know whether he should be going this far in public about something like this because I get, especially like you know, it jeopardizes 
a potential double point to finish for Alpine. I mean, I doubt it, but you, you know, it's still because at least Pierre Gasly was able to get that car and keep that car at ninth place, get a good point to finish. Uh, and now, obviously, level on points with the Williams. Um, I think Alex Albon also finished in the points. So, yeah. It's, it's going to be. Isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, go on. It's, it's going to be. If only, it's going to. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be interested to see how those dynamics. Because obviously, everyone knows about Gasly and Ocon not having the greatest of relationships beforehand. It doesn't seem um, like Ocon the... really has a good relationship with anyone, to be honest, that he's he's a racing driver with. I guess you could sit with, what, Perez. Verstappen after that moment in Brazil, he doesn't he doesn't make friendships only. No, in not very easily. Yes. But then, um, yeah. But then again, I'm also I do slightly agree with Bruno Fernandes comments because I don't that was completely unnecessary from Ocon to try and barge his way through because there was genuinely nowhere for Pierre Gasly to go, especially the amount of space Ocon left. Gasly was literally a passenger in that incident there. So yeah, it's gonna be. Interesting. It was quite funny to see that how the stewards awarded Ocon a 10 second penalty after Ocon had DNF'd. Um, yeah, and then so. they quite rightly decided to grant that to a five place grid penalty, which he'll be getting in Canada in two weeks' time. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think I've, I don't think I've, I think that might be the first time I've ever seen a, a time penalty being given to a driver who has DNF'd. But that was quite interesting. But but yeah, you're definitely right. It's and especially in the context, well, not just obviously, as we know, it's Monaco, it's that turn. And you're right, you don't, you can't just hang it round round the inside because, well, inevitably that is what's going to happen or something worse. But Bruno Pamela is right that it's it's Alpine, they're having a terrible season and they they need all the points they can get. And the only way that they're going to do that that for as as with any of the kind of midfield or lower down teams is that the teammates have got to work together and Ocon doing that is the complete opposite of what that was um and so he he's right it's it's completely inappropriate um from from Ocon and um definitely like well, he, um, yeah so but at least Ocon did come and say it was his fault on on um not completely. Oh, did he? I didn't, I didn't realize that. Fair enough. No, I'm pretty, I'm pretty fair sure enough. he did. He, I mean, or he was like, oh, I was in a, I think initially it was like it was an unfortunate accident, but or unless that was a famine kind of forcing Ocon to say it's my fault and do public yeah, apology I think, or something. Yeah, when you when you see what Bruno Famine came out and, and and said, I think Ocon's quite wise to to apologize for it. But the interesting part, I thought he said, is he he said something along the lines of a decision, a tough decision will have to be made. Is that actually speculating about Ocon's future? Because, like, if it is, and they are looking to replace Ocon, which I think personally is it's the only reason we're talking about it is because it was in Bruno Famine's like comments, or it's kind of maybe subtly implied. But no one was really talking about that before this, and that's mainly because I think well, as we I think we mentioned on a previous episode, perhaps like the driver the driver episode that we did, um, that you can't can't really scrutinize either of the drivers when the car is that bad and yeah it's, it's and that's to say why his his seat or well, neither of their seats have really been under pressure from from the performances that, they, that they've had and surely it would be surely it would be too too quick to to get rid of Ocon in that seat yeah yeah I don't it's quite difficult getting like 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 you mentioned it's like I said, the car is just terrible, so you can't scrutinize both drivers. But then, neither driver driver have had an absolutely stellar ending to the um, past as well. I mean, Pierre Gasly obviously did a fantastic job in Alfa Tauri of the 2028 Monza being the highlight. But then, after before after, there's not that many highlights that he's had. And then, same with Esteban Ocon, he's not had a spectacular. Um, career so far. I mean, yes, he's obviously won in Hungary, but that was extremely lucky circumstances because obviously the Bottas decided to do wee bowling, um, decided to miss <laughs> playing the wee too much. So, you know, he's yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's a it's gonna, yeah, 
I, it'll be interesting to see what this comes out with. I'm hopefully not speculating the future because if something like this is a bit harsh, and Alpino certainly yeah. not. They're not the. Then they're also not the best run team in the grid. Let's be honest. So. Hmm. But yes, certainly we'll have to see how that uh, that those events kind of uh, seem to, to to carry on uh, into the F1 world uh, before we get to Canada in two weeks' time. Um, so that really concludes uh, what we wanted to mention for the uh, for our review of the Monaco Grand Prix. Uh, the only other thing I'd like to mention uh, just very quickly is um, I can do this while Will Kingswood is not here. Uh, all of the sporting world is balanced, and the reason and the consequence of Leclerc winning is that Man United did win the FA Cup final, which uh, you know it's a dark day for the uh, the football world, isn't it? <laughs> but well, um, well, for us, it will be. But... <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. If, uh, if you don't know, uh, Jimmy and I are Liverpool fans, so we uh, yeah we can we can say it while while Will Kingswood, a Man United fan, is not here. Um, I'm sure. Give it us, us some stick for it next uh, next time round, but <laughs> um, yes, uh, unfortunately for them uh, winning, it's a very dark day indeed. But uh, we'll have to move on. So anyway, that's as we mentioned, that concludes our episode. Uh, thank you very much, Chimmy, for joining me, and also Will, even though he's had to leave a bit early. Um, but yes, thank you very much for listening, and we will see you next time round. Bye.